As soon as I start my sake production, I have to be here every single day. That part I wasn't quite ready for. Sake making is a lot about the tradition. Making a product that is so traditionally tied to the culture of Japan, it's one of the oldest crafts on the planet. I often think of proud craftsmen in Japan and all fields. When uh, it came to sake making, my husband Jake and I want to have the same pride of what we do with the sake we made. I didn't even like sake that much, to be honest, until I had my very first unpasteurized sake, which is namazake. And uh, unpasteurized sake has a lot more kind of natural, earthy flavors. And just my first experience realized, wow, sake could be so flavor rich. Most sake that comes in the U.S. has been heat pasteurized twice, once in the tank and then again in the bottle. And that's to make it shelf stable so it can go all over the planet and not have to worry about keeping it cold. Unpasteurized namazake, you have to keep cold because it's live. We have not killed any of the yeast, any of the enzymes, so they're constantly changing because it should be treated like fresh food. It is really fresh and bright. Both my husband and I, we lived in Japan from 2001 to 2011 and came back to San Francisco. Then I was really surprised to see this Japanese food culture was booming. And uh, there are a lot more premium sakes available uh, at retail stores. However, they still didn't have our most favorite sake, which is namazake. So we decided, okay, if we can't get it, then why don't we make it? That's how we started home brewing sake in our garage. Sake was this huge mystery. How can rice and water taste like honeydew melon? How? The sake market in the States has been around sort of since the 70s. The wine people didn't really fully accept sake in the beginning. They always thought it was sort of this novelty. People didn't get it. Sake represented one thing. It was an extension of sushi. Nobody ever thought about sake without thinking about sushi first. Everybody had the same thought. All sake tasted like this. They had no idea sake tasted like this. And they're very light and flavored sakes, and there's very nuanced sakes, and there's fruity sakes, and there's, and so people started realizing, oh my gosh, there's so many different types of sakes. We wanted to make more local sake using local ingredients. So thought we'll try it with local California rice first. Originally, rice came to America via 
the East Coast in the early 1600s, and then in California around the 1850s. And this was during the gold rush and the railroads, and rice was brought in by immigrant workers, mainly from China. There was a lot of rice imported to feed these workers. There was interest in trying to develop it as a local crop. Later on, it was determined that rice could grow quite well a little bit further north, and a scientist from the USDA um, actually was the first one to grow a rice crop successfully in California in about 1908. Shortly thereafter, farmers became interested, and rice production started at about 1911. And now it's become really part of the lifeblood of this region. Uh, rice is locally sourced in uh, California. For me, that was a key aspect to be able to have control of our rice from the paddy all the way through to the bottle. Um, California has a long history of rice cultivation. Very fortunate to me, I can call up to uh, rice growers in Sacramento, which is only two hours from here, and I can order my rice. We've been growing Calrose in California for so long, and we've really perfected it to, to grow with really high yields, but also be a really high quality grain. Um, Calrose originated from a sake rice variety, Watare Bune, which is really well renowned. Farmers will take our, our beautiful, clean, cool water that we get from the snowmelt of the Sierra Nevada mountains. They'll bring it onto the field, and it's only about five inches of water. When you look at a rice field, it seems like there's so much water on there, but it's really only about five inches. Similar to Japan, California has a really wet, cold winter and a really hot, dry summer. In the summertime, it's really hot in the day, but it cools off at night, and this gives the plant a time to rest. Um, so by resting, it's able to really mature into a nice, beautiful japonica variety. Once this water is on the field, then they'll drop the seed by airplane. As the rice plant emerges from the water, it'll grow out and mature all through the summer, in a nice hot summer. We'll begin to harvest the rice and then mill it down to sake rice. You really want to get to that sweet, starchy center in the middle of the rice, uh, shimpaku center, and that white center is where all these sugars live. For sake rice, what you need to do is continue to mill it down so you get right down into that shimpaku center and take away as many proteins as you can as a junmai sake would be a 70% sake, so then you're milling 30% of the outer layer of the rice kernel off, or a daiginjo sake would be a 50% milled sake, so then you're milling 50% of the rice kernel off. So you can imagine that takes a lot of rice to make a daiginjo sake and it gives it a cleaner uh, flavor, and it's probably more fruity, more fragrant, um, and that is just some of the best sake and the most expensive sake you can buy. With Sequoia Sake, these guys who are using sort of a whole craft movement of saying, wow, let's, let's make something here. And as a retailer, I was like, hallelujah, because sake coming from Japan is relatively expensive. I think the market is really open and ready to something called craft sake. 
or microbrewery sake because there's such a huge craft movement now. I was born and raised in Kyoto, Japan. I had a lot of fun, just like a normal kid, but I was always somewhat frustrated because Kyoto was very conservative, traditional community. And also my parents were very conservative and uh, old fashioned. Look at this Japanese saying that uh, a woman should obey her parents when young and obey her husband when married and obeys her children when old. And both my community and my parents thought I should be just like that. I kind of knew I didn't belong in there, and I was always looking for a way out. First year in college, I took a summer course in Hawaii. I felt at home from the beginning because I expected American people accepting differences. I felt so at ease. This is where I wanted to be, and uh, it was real. I was going to Buffalo State University, and I uh, got a scholarship to go to Japan, and that's where Noriko was also going to the same school. It was coming into the headmaster's office while she was walking out of the headmaster's office, and I stepped on her foot. Um, unbeknownst to me, it was just released from a cast, and I felt so bad I had to apologize and take her out to dinner, and that's how it got started. We met in our early 20s, and it took me another five years to convince her to marry me. Is it done? I don't know. What do you think? Is it done? Yeah, it's done. Yeah, I want the crispy part. I want the crispy oh, one. OK. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Ha, ha. Sky-sama. Come bye. Bye. Mm, so we're going to start right. First thing in the morning, right? I'm tomorrow gonna start morning. rice tomorrow morning. Yeah. So yeah. I can just show up like nine o'clock? Show up at nine o'clock and I'll be yeah. ready. Well, eight forty-five. My grandmother, we always ate canned vegetables that we canned ourselves, all the jams we made ourselves. So I really had an appreciation of, you know, um, tetsukuri or you know handmade foods. It was like part of our life. We always did our own pickling. My mother did that. So it was like a real natural part of my life. And I was a very curious child. I always wanted to experience and see something new, something different. When it comes to food, I was dying to try all these like modern style food, Western food, but my parents and my brother, they just wanted to eat kind of same old thing. The only way for me to experience those, you know, fancy food, you know, the new exotic food, that was to uh, cook it myself. So I bought several cookbooks and learned how to cook. When uh, it came to sake making too, it just occurred naturally to me that, okay, then why don't we just make it? Because that's what I've done all my life. Try this new batch of Genshu. I thought I would bring it to you and ask your feedback. Yeah. Okay. Uh, should I pull all three? Oh, yeah, this please. one? Yeah, okay. Perfect. So yes. I taste out of three vessels usually. Oh. Because when I write my reviews, uh -huh. I don't ever know what people are going to drink at, at home with. So I'm going to jump right in. Mm -hmm. Wow, I can already tell there's a, 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 a real nice smoothness. Ah. A very nice body to it. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign. Mm. It tastes a little drier this, this year. What is the uh, SMB? It's plus eight. The next evolution, the next expression of sake were people who were making sake in the States. Since sake is like a handheld beverage, since it's a story category of, of alcohol, 
you have to tell a story. What better story than this is a locally made sake by these people. This is us. This is our people, our water, our rice, our materials, everything. It's us. This is the flavor of us. Mm -hmm. it really has a nice balance to mm -hmm. it. So I get impact and then I get a very clean sip, sort of velvety flavor. It's mm -hmm. nice. It's, okay. it's a richness, but it doesn't okay. drink heavy rich. It's great. It's oh. fantastic. Thank you. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a few things we did definitely with this pack. So when I pour now, I have that, I have the story. And those guys, the craft makers, are the real storytellers right now. So when we got started, I asked a lot of Japanese contemporaries in Japan who were already making sake. I said, hey, I'm going to make sake in, in uh, California. What do you think? And their first comment was, well, California only has table rice. Sake can be produced from what's considered table rice, uh, but for the premium types of sake, there are specific attributes that are of interest. Those include having uh, what's called a white core. This is called shinpaku in the Japanese language. Because the market is table rice, uh, milled white rice, um, the attributes that they are looking for actually are translucent kernels ones that don't have this white core. Whereas uh, people who are interested in sake brewing varieties would like to retain that feature. My interest in working with Sequoia Sake is that they're really trying to emulate what's being done in Japan uh, with the premium sake varieties. They were interested in some ancestral California varieties that is in my area of expertise in terms of rice genetics we began a conversation about um, the development of some of these ancestral varieties. The heirloom rice is a pretty big gamble for us. It's a lot of time and a lot of expense. My friends in the sake business in Japan, they have a wide variety of rice they can choose, and they blend back different rice to create a new product. And you get all these flavor profiles out of it. I am really limited, so it's really, really important for me to get this rice right. If this heirloom rice doesn't come out to produce the best product, I'll probably go back to the drawing board to find another rice or another solution to bring another variety of rice to the table. We grew it last year for the first year inside a greenhouse. Um, this year we got approval to actually grow it outside, so hopefully I'll grow enough of it that I can then grow it into a real plot next year and have it so I can use it in sake production. So this is the one that just came out of barrel. And this one, I adjusted alcohol back to 17.8. It's, uh, yeah, this has a significantly more better mouthfeel than mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. adjusted one. So the aroma is incredible also. I want to make sure we retain the craftsmanship in this brewery. Touch something, feel something, smell something, use my five senses. Most of the time, the making sake is hard work, but very, very enjoyable. Most of friends thought we were crazy. And they're like, really? Are you serious? And when it comes to my family, they actually still don't know I'm making sake. <laughs> they think I still work for this you know, big company. Because my parents are so conservative. They think it, the most important thing in life is to have a stable job. So if they find out I left and now started making sake, they'll totally freak out. And now they're getting old, so I don't, I don't want to shock them. Uh, right. I don't know when I come out to them. Oh, 
close, close, close. Close. Pour it away, to the left. That's light. That's really light. That's really light. I am incredibly satisfied when I taste the product and it tastes what I was expecting, or I taste some of the rice that it, I know came from our farmer. I mean, it's so gratifying to know that all that hard work, it, I didn't make any mistakes along the way, and it actually came together. My hat is off to sake makers because they're a different breed of cat. They've embraced the repetitive motion of creating something, but that's their strength. So when you're doing something in an environment, you're doing it over and over and over, that repetition is methodic in one sense and it's carthotic in the other. It is, it's a way of life. So we all put a lot of effort into sake making. It's hard work. So when we finally bottle sake, or you know, before bottling, tasting the sake we made, we're not 100% confident that this is the best sake we could have made. Or, you know, even worried, will people like this sake? of creating sake, you know, making something live and then having it go out there and people having my sake with their dinner is just amazing. I'm making a, a real live product. This is a passion. This is a lifestyle I chose. Uh, sometimes we're really happy with the quality or the outcome. Some other time, not as much. And uh, so, then we think about okay, what we did differently with this batch and how we should change the next batch. So already thinking about the next batch, it's just part of the process, not the end. I think for sake to become a part of American cuisine, all it's gonna take is for people to try it. It's so wonderful, especially these fresh local namasakis. I really see the movement of craft brewers and the local movement to really drive this. As sake becomes elevated and, and consumers are looking for higher quality sake and different varieties, we are growing with that industry. These are the people who have dedicated their life to a, a, a very difficult lifestyle and it's admirable especially today. You can get machines to make sake for you and you can go on vacation. They don't do that. They make it by hand and it's awesome. Spend the time to enjoy what you're doing and it's the process that really is important. I think I bring that to the sake making. That's what I love about the sake making. It's, it's of the moment of making it. With Sequoia Sake, they're doing it as well as their mentors, what have you, in Japan. I'm confident that what's in the bottles that they produce tells the story of sake. Sequoia Sake is making sake right here in the dog patch in, in San Francisco. This is really being able to capture the making, the local production of sake. That gives it its flavor. That gives it its style. That gives it its unique characteristics. I'm just happy if I can just keep doing what I enjoy now, as long as uh, I can keep working. 
I really cannot think of where we should be or where we want to be. You remember all the happy memories and uh, all the, the hard work and see, okay, now, you know, it's, it's something that we go into, send out to the world and feel all these hard work and struggles. Everything was worthwhile. <laughs>